Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the Horseshoe Crab Board. Um, the board is now in session. Uh, I'm your chair, John Clark. I'm the administrative commissioner from the first state, Delaware. And I'm joined up here at the front by our advisory panel chair, Brett Hoffmeister, and ASMFC's dynamic duo of horseshoe crabs, plan coordinator, Caitlin Starks, and assessment scientist, Kristen Anstead. And between them, they'll be able to cover so many of the things that we're gonna be talking about today. So let's move on to item two, which is board consent. Uh, first on the agenda, there's going to be a slight rearrangement. It will just make things uh, work better in the flow. We're gonna to go to agenda item five, which is to uh, review the results of the ARM model. That way we'll have all the description of what's going on with the ARM before we consider addendum eight, but we will not be taking action on item five. The action will be taken in order. So we'll be taking action on addendum eight, and then we will be going to item five, which is to set the specifications and taking action on that. So it's just a slight rearrangement. Uh, having said all that, are there any further um, revisions to the agenda? Seeing none, the revised agenda is accepted by consent. Uh, proceedings from the August 2022 meeting. Are there any revisions or comments about the proceedings? Seeing none, those are also approved by consent. Okay, we move on to item number three, public comment. Is there any public comment for items not on the agenda? And I've been told, no, there is not. And I just want to make clear that we are not going to be allowing further comment on draft addendum eight or on the ARM model. Um, we had ample opportunity to comment on the draft beginning with the August board meeting and through the many hearings and during the open comment period. The uh, number of comments received, as everybody saw, was huge. The board appreciates the uh, effort, thought, and passion shown in those comments and We'll fully consider those comments. Uh, they will all be kept summarized by Caitlin during the uh, addendum process here. And uh, we will be carefully considering those when we make our decisions. So just wanted to make that clear. Okay, having said all that, now we move on to our next item, which will then be uh, item five, part of item, the, the presentations for item five. And I'll turn it over to Kristen for that. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kristen Anstead. I'm the Commission Stock Assessment Scientist on Horseshoe Crab, and today I'll be presenting the Delaware Bay Harvest Recommendations from the ARM Subcommittee and the Delaware Bay Ecosystem TC. So since the implementation of the ARM framework, the Delaware Bay Ecosystem Technical Committee, the TC, and the Adaptive Resource Management Subcommittee, the ARM, uh, have met annually to review the data on horseshoe crabs and red knots and make a harvest recommendation to the board. As a reminder, both of these committees are made up of horseshoe crab biologists, shorebird biologists, state and federal representatives, and stock assessment scientists. Both committees have approximately a 50-50 split of shorebird and horseshoe crab representation, although there has been some turnover in the last couple months and we will be repopulating those committees. This year is a little different because we're currently un operating under Addendum 7, which is the old arm. That's how I'm going to refer to it throughout this presentation is the old arm. That's the 2012 arm. Uh, but we're also considering addendum eight which is the revised arm or the new arm and so at our annual meeting of the delaware bay ecosystem tc and the arm subcommittee we considered both of these methods and discussed the recommendation for the board also i'm going to spend a little bit more time on the details today than i normally do because of the immense public interest in the science and the process around the arm revision so first let's talk about the old arm up here in the italics are the objective statement for the arm this was developed through lengthy discussions with the technical committees, managers, and stakeholders during the development of the original ARM framework. To achieve this objective, which is to manage horseshoe crabs in the Delaware Bay region, to maximize harvest, but also maintain ecosystem integrity and provide adequate stopover habitat for migrating shorebirds. To achieve this, the ARM model was developed where the harvest of females, female horseshoe crabs, is decreased or prohibited when the red knots and female horseshoe crab abundances are low, and the male harvest would be decreased or prohibitive when horseshoe crab population sex ratio limits the population growth. The original arm had a couple population thresholds 
for both species, which I'll go over in the following slides. And the horseshoe crab population was estimated from the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey. And the red knot population was estimated from Mark Recite model using tagging data. There were five harvest packages uh, that could be recommended for the board's consideration on an annual basis. Here are the original five harvest packages. So the need for these five discrete packages was due to modeling limitations at the time. We couldn't have continuous packages where there were all available options for both sexes um, up to the maximum allowable harvest by sex. So we had harvest package one, which is what full moratorium for both sexes for all states in the region. Harvest package two and three were low and high male only harvest for when the populations were below their thresholds. And package four and five were low and high harvest packages for both sexes when the threshold was met. Again, female harvest was always an option in the original arm. And the two of the five possible harvest packages included female harvest. So the maximum harvest allowed, so for example, 210,000 for females was agreed, agreed upon by the committee deliberations during the development of the original arm. So let's talk a little bit about the thresholds in the old arm framework. The ARM model recommends female harvest only when the abundance of red knots reaches 81,900 birds. And that was a value related to historic abundance of red knots in the region. And or when the abundance of female horseshoe crabs reaches 80% of a carrying capacity. So that was 11.2 million female horseshoe crabs, assuming a carrying capacity of 14 million. Stakeholders at the time of the original ARM framework agreed that the if the female population grew to 80% of that carrying capacity, that harvest would not be considered a limiting factor for the red knot population growth. The carrying capacity was based on a paper by Suica and all in 2007. It was an age structured model based on life history parameters. And at the time it was the best science available. So on an annual basis, the ARM model is used to select the harvest packages out of those five packages to implement for the next year, given the current state of how many horseshoe crabs are in the system and how many red knots are in the system. So for red knots, uh, the red line is that 81,900 threshold, the population threshold for red knots. The blue line are the mark recite estimates. Those are the ones we use in the ARM framework and you can see their error bars. There's a little bit more error in the last few years and that's due to sampling around COVID that there was some reduced teams, but the survey was still fully in operation. You can just see a little bit more error. The green line are the aerial and ground counts. We don't use that as an input to the ARM framework, but the committees annually look at several data streams in their uh, deliberations. And so that's just included on the graph. Red knot abundance estimates from the Mark Recite estimate in the spring of 2022 was 39,800 red knots. The data in the methods around the estimation can be found in the meeting materials. Uh, they're provided by Jim Lyons from the USGS. Um, for red knots, the popula population estimate in 2022 was slightly lower than 2021, as was the amount of time that the birds spent on average in the region. Okay, for horseshoe crabs, the old arm used the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey to estimate population abundance. And the top graph is females. You can see the population threshold of 11.2 on that graph. And the bottom graph is males. The survey was not funded for a few years there in the middle. And those years are indicated by the dashed lines. Uh, index was developed from other surveys in the region to make up data for those years uh, to have a continuous time series. You can also see that in the terminal year 2021 that the um, females have exceeded their population threshold. So I just for one minute want to talk about the different stages and how we use that in the ARM framework. The Virginia Tech Trawl Survey uh, collects data on three stages. So immature or juveniles. For females that would be about ages zero to eight. We have newly mature horseshoe crabs which are around nine um, and those are horseshoe crabs that are newly mature in the fall and will spot will participate in beach spawning the following spring and provide uh, eggs for the birds. Then we have the mature stage, which is 10 plus for females. So everything else. So each year on an annual time step that newly mature becomes mature horseshoe crabs. When we're doing the arm framework, we're adding the newly mature and mature together from the fall because that's what's gonna provide a stopover for the birds in the following year. So because that survey operates in the fall, 
we take away half a year of natural mortality before we use that population estimate in the ARM framework. So there were 15.5 million females and 44.9 million males in the Virginia Tech trial survey in this last, in 2021. We subtracted a half a year of natural mortality. And so going into the ARM framework for the old ARM this year, there were 13.5 million females and 39.1 million males. Uh, as you probably know, this is the first year that the population estimate from the Virginia Tech trial has exceeded the threshold. Since its implementation, the ARM has recommended harvest package three, which is that 500,000 male only harvest because both female horseshoe crabs and red knots were below their threshold. So using the old ARM framework and the agreed upon objectives, thresholds and harvest packages, the harvest recommendation for 2023 would be harvest package five, maximum female harvest because that threshold was exceeded. So even though the red knots have not reached their population threshold, the female harvest is recommended because the population is above their threshold and like unlikely to be the limiting factor at that point. Um, this is a example of the harvest allocation between the states using that harvest package five. Uh, not all the states in the Delaware Bay are thought to be 100% Delaware Bay origin, so I won't belabor this slide, but you have your Delaware Bay origin that's coming from the maximum harvest, harvest package five, how it's divvied up between the states, and then Maryland and Virginia's crabs are not 100% Delaware Bay origin, so their quotas are slightly adjusted. But that has more to do with Caitlin's presentation, and so we can save some of the questions about allocation for later. Let's talk about the new arm. So who asked for this? Why was the ARM revised? Uh, the ARM subcommittee was tasked with revising the ARM framework to incorporate new data. We have 10 years of data since the previous ARM was developed, as well as move the model to a different software plat platform. The old ARM is run in an obsolete platform and we can't update it anymore. So it had to be moved to a different place if we wanted to continue to use the ARM framework. Additionally, this is a routine part of stock assessments to update a model and data on a three, five, 10 year time series, depending on the species life history. So it's it's fairly normal and part of our process to redo stock assessments uh, on this time scale. During the ARM revision, the committees added to the previous objective statement. So that's the same objective statement, but we have added the additional part in red to ensure that the abundance of horseshoe crabs is not limiting the red knot stopover population or slowing recovery. This was implicit in the original arm, but we made it explicit in our objective statement as we continued to revise this model. Uh, the red knots are estimated the same way in the new arm, so from the mark recite estimates, and the horseshoe crab now is estimated from a catch survey model. The catch survey model uses and heavily relies on the Virginia Tech trawl survey as well as two other surveys in the region that provide additional information on abundance, uh, natural mortality, and it accounts for all sources of quantifiable removals, so bait, biomedical mortality, and commercial dead discards from other fisheries. This is considered an improvement over the previous methods since we are now using a population model instead of a swept area population estimate. Because we can do more modeling now, we have continuous harvest packages, so anywhere between for example, for females, zero and 210,000 females can be selected depending on their abundance. And additionally, the males and the female harvest are no longer linked to each other. So each species or each sex of uh, horseshoe crab, that uh, the quota can be recommended based uh, solely on their own population. Also, we have incorporated biomedical data, which was a specific task from the board when we went to do this revision, was to account for that mortality in the model. We have done that, but the Delaware Bay specific biomedical data is confidential. So we have developed the model both using coastwide data, no biomedical data, but we make our harvest recommendation based on that confidential run. So you'll see ranges here in my following slides. These are the horseshoe crab population estimates coming out of the catch survey model. <clears throat> the females are on the top and the male horseshoe crabs are on the bottom. And you see the two runs here, one with the coastwide biomedical and one with no biomedical data. The Delaware Bay specific is confidential, but the harvest recommendations are made on that run. 
So what I'm showing you is the upper and lower bounds of what that population is based on that confidential data. And you can see they overlap for the most part because uh, the biomedical is, um, the, the coast-wide harvest as well as no harvest uh, is on a much smaller scale than the, the millions of the population estimate. Between the two runs, females are between six and 6.1 million mature crabs in 2021, and the males are between 15.9 and 16 million. So that real value using the confidential data is somewhere between there. So why is this so different from Virginia Tech trawl? As I'm sure you recall that Virginia Tech trawl, we had our highest value in the entire time series in 2021. Well, they're different for a couple of reasons, and I, I'll go through those, but what I'm showing here on the top graph is the newly mature and the mature females on the bottom. This is just females. We're going to talk about females for a minute, and I've split them out by sex. So first of all, the two methods are just different. Uh, the uh, Virginia Tech trawl, the total abundance that they're coming up with their estimate annually is from extrapolating that mean catch per tow to the entire Delaware Bay region versus the catch survey model, which is a population model. So they're different methods. Additionally, Virginia Tech trawl is conducted in the fall, so the catch survey model lags that forward to match the timing of the other surveys and the removals. And so the 2020 Virginia Tech data point is being used to inform the 2021. So the catch survey model is about a year behind the Virginia Tech trawl. So that very high data point actually isn't even in the catch survey model yet. The terminal year of 2021 is using the 2020 Virginia Tech trawl data. Thirdly, the catch survey population estimate is highly influenced by that stage abundance data that I talked about from the Virginia Tech trawl. The model is having a hard time reconciling those low values that started in 2019 of the newly mature, which is the top graph. You can see a dramatic drop in 2019. Um, with the very high values of the mature, that is a one-year time step. So where are those crabs coming from? So that's one reason the model is estimating that population to be lower, is it, it's fitting so closely to the newly mature, it can't make sense out of the very high values of where those crabs are coming from. So it's probably underestimating the population. So... Um, Committees have discussed this. So we talked about this at our meeting. What is going on with this newly mature stage? And we have three hypotheses about what could be happening. One, maybe we have a catchability issue that for some reason, newly mature and mature are not happening in the same place as they used to. We have assumed thus far that we're catching them at the same rates and they're in the same time and space. Maybe something has changed and the newly mature is hanging out somewhere else during the time of the survey. Also, could there be a recruitment failure? That's another possibility. If in 2019, when they suddenly disappeared, that would mean in 2010, so nine years previous, there was a recruitment failure. And I think that's probably an appealing hypothesis for some because that was time of higher uh, harvest before the arm was implemented. That's still kind of hard to reconcile with these really high mature values. They still have to come from somewhere. So how do we believe these really high values with the really low, which is the stage before? So it's still hard to make that make sense, but it's still a possibility. Thirdly, it could be an identification issue. There's a lot of nuance in staging the crabs. And while the um, survey has trained technicians on board, you know, their staffing changes, could there suddenly be an issue identifying these and they're being misclassified either as mature and contributing to those large numbers, but they're actually newly mature or maybe they're being classified as juveniles. We haven't decided which we think is the best explanation yet for what is happening for these newly mature. It does matter because you can see its influence on the catch survey model. We have a couple lines of evidence we can look at going forward. NEMAP stages the crabs, we can look to them. They don't catch them in as high as rates as Virginia Tech. So it would be informative, but probably not a data input into the model, but we can look at it. What is the ratio of newly mature to mature? Are they also finding that these crabs are disappearing? Or is there something happening in the Virginia Tech trawl specifically? Delaware adult trawl has also started staging crabs. I have about four or five years of data from that. That's another place we can look. So we have ways going forward to try to figure this out and try to resolve this in the model. Okay, so just as a reminder, 
using the new arm, this is how many red knots we have going in this year, how many female horseshoe crabs, and how many males. These are the harvest policy functions for the catch or for the revised arm. So first we have the males in blue. So this is showing the optimal harvest for 10,000 simulation runs. And so on the x-axis for the males, you have a male abundance, and then you can see that curved line that goes from zero harvest up to the 500,000 and the asymptotes there at the top. If you follow the 15,000, which is approximately how many males we had in 2021, you can see that it's pretty much intersecting with about 500,000. So you would expect most likely your male harvest recommendation is gonna be around that 500,000 maximum, maybe slightly lower if you haven't quite reached the, the total flattening out point. For females, it's a little different. So we have our light yellow, which is zero recommended female harvest, up to the 210 maximum in the dark red. And that gradient moves across the graph. So you can see that harvest gradually ramps up. So on the x-axis, you have the red knot population. And on the y, you have the female horseshoe crab population. And the blob in the middle is where most of our simulated runs end up. So you can see there aren't a lot of cases in our simulations where we end up at maximum harvest or at zero harvest because the female population has been so high for a few years that we're not seeing female uh, populations in our entire time series at around like 2 million or anything like that. So most of the runs end up in this blob. So if you follow our birds in 2021, which was about 42,000 to the 6 million females, you can anticipate that the harvest is probably going to be somewhere around that 100,000 range. So why is this different from how female harvest was handled in the old arm, specifically that 11.2 million, where you saw before it was no harvest, and now in the revised arm, there's a little bit of female harvest. So this was a criticism from the original peer review, as well as structured decision-making experts, that the threshold was not properly handled in the old arm framework. For one, there was concern among the peer review as well as the arm committee that the recommendations would go from harvest package three the female moratorium to maximum female harvest if that threshold was exceeded and that's exactly what we saw this year we were concerned about that because basically the arm was functioning like a harvest control rule below this level no harvest above this level maximum harvest and that's because from a modeling perspective, 210,000 horseshoe crabs is not a significant number compared to 11.2 million. So it's almost always gonna go to maximum harvest once you exceed the threshold, and that was concerning. Additionally, uh, the modeling perspective, that threshold was considered too prescriptive. You're telling the model the answer already. You don't need to do adaptive management or have a complicated model to say zero females below this level 210 above this level. You don't need all that to do that. So it's too prescriptive to have that constraint in the model that says you can only harvest females above or below this. So the way that we handled it from a modeling perspective was to gradually give females as the population increases. So that you, as you saw in this graph, there's a gradient. So a little bit of females at uh, a lower population levels and you slowly ramp up but there's almost no scenario where we now hit that 210. You'd have to have about 30 million females to get up to that versus the 11.2 that we see in the old arm framework. Um, so that was considered to be more in line with structured decision making. And that was advice we got from structured decision making modelers that are not specific to this field. It was just that that was not the proper way to handle it in the old arm. Okay, so the harvest recommendation coming out of the new arm, there were two options in addendum eight, B1 and B2, and they were both rounding conventions to protect the biomedical data. So if you use B1, you would have 475,000 male harvest recommended for 2023 and 125,000 females. So if the males were recommended from the new arm to be 500,000, we don't round down. So you know by looking at this that the male population using confidential data is somewhere between 476 and 499. If it hits that 500,000, we don't round down. If you round down to the nearest 50,000, you can see that the quota, um, the optimal harvest is there. 
it's likely that this rounding in the final harvest recommendation overwhelms the effects of additional uncertainty incorporated in the horseshoe crab model. So when we got that 6 million estimate coming out of the catch survey model, when compared to the 15.5 million coming out of Virginia Tech, we were less concerned about it. One, because it'll be more conservative, our estimates likely an underestimate and will result in lower harvest, but also because that blob that you saw on that colorful graph most of the harvest falls around a similar level for many levels of female horseshoe crab. So you're not moving the needle as much. If we put in 15.5 million, that harvest recommendation still will not jump to 210. It's gonna be lower than it was in the old model. So the difference between 6 million and 15.5 million, while it sounds like a lot, the way that we have gradually tuned that harvest makes it a less dramatic harvest recommendation. And so finally, my last slide is after the armed committees reviewed all of that and talked about what's going on between the two models, as well as the newly mature horseshoe crab, we had consensus among the committees that the harvest recommendation from the new arm was preferred over the old arm uh, for those reasons. I'll do my best to answer any questions. Thank you, Kristen, for that brilliant and thorough summary of the two different models that really is great for informing the discussion about the uh the addendum but before we do that that's a lot to digest there so does anybody have questions i see bill hyatt thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you uh mr chair and this is a question for kristen uh so uh, looking at the uh, earlier in your presentation you mentioned 11.2 million crabs as not only just the where you're trying to get, but you mentioned it as a as a level that's not limiting. So that was determined to be not limiting for the red knot uh, performance. You also talked throughout your presentation on the, the estimates from the Virginia Tech draw, um, the catch survey method, how they differed, how the catch survey method was an improvement, and that the numbers of females uh, estimate is around six million now, based based upon the 2021 analysis. So it, is it safe to say that regards to number of females, we're in the ballpark of halfway to the number that need to be out there in order to be non-limiting to the red knots? Is that sort of a safe way to look at the gestalt of all this? We no longer have that 11.2 threshold. So my short answer is no, actually, uh, that the 11.2 threshold was based on that Suica paper from 2007. It was the best, but it borrowed information from New Hampshire for some of the life history parameters and from the literature. We have data in the region now, so we no longer have a threshold in our revised arm, but we have a projected equilibrium point of the model and it, it is lower than that 11.2 but 11.2 isn't in the model anymore so we're not comparing that six million against anything does that answer your question not entirely so the the 11.2 million is is you know i was looking at it not so much as a threshold but as something that had been sort of uh, determined through the process as Here's here's the number to achieve in order to not be limiting to the red knot population. So I guess my follow up question would be, wherein, what number would you describe of of female horseshoe crabs would be not limiting? And if that number hasn't been determined yet, I wonder if there is an an effort underway to determine that that number, or if it's practical to actually determine that number yeah it, it's a great question and, and it has come up we have our projection now that goes out to kind of an equilibrium point it was lower i believe it was closer to an 8 million but it's not we're not measuring necessarily against that anymore there's 11.2 wasn't a magical number it was just the best number we had at the time and so we have not updated that analysis to have a revised carrying capacity that answered for you, Bill? Yeah, it answers the question, although, uh, you know, conceptually, I think that given whenever you're dealing with uh, trying to recover a threatened or endangered species, the, uh, the, the ob objective one way or another is to try to get to a point where you're no longer limiting. And it, that's just a conceptual approach to, to that aspect of conservation biology that, you know, I, I, I feel probably should be part of this process. 
Thanks, Bill. Uh, next question is from Mike Luisi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this may this may come later with Caitlin's presentation, but I'm just wondering. So the arm recommendation is from both male and female harvest, but if if states that prosecute this fishery choose to not, they don't want to harvest females. What what options do we have from there? And that this may this may be coming later. So maybe I can hold back. I can ask the question again um, after Caitlin's presentation. But I'm just I'm just wondering what options we have if our industry um, doesn't want they don't want to prosecute the female crab. Um, so I'll leave it there and see what what you think's best, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, before we that will definitely be coming up, but Kristen does have some response to that. I just want to say, from a modeling perspective, if you all don't harvest females, that doesn't matter to us as an arm committee. This is the optimal harvest of what you could harvest up to these limits to feel confident that you're not impacting the red knot population. So if you don't harvest it. Anywhere from zero to that is within the bounds of the, the science, the best science we have available. Thanks, Kristen. And I uh, see Rick Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole, but having read Addendum 8 several times and trying to understand one of the caveats within it, I saw that there's an exception for Maryland and Virginia. And that exception is if there's a dis action by the board when there could be a harvest of female horseshoe crabs to not allow the harvest of female horseshoe crabs, there's a two to one offset for Maryland and Virginia where they may take two male horseshoe crabs for each female horseshoe crab they would have been allowed as a quota. What was unclear from that, but what I think I understood was that the quotas assigned to Virginia and Maryland included harvest of female hor or horseshoe crabs both in the bay and outside of the bay and that the additional compensatory male harvest would be attributed to the quota outside of the bay not inside the bay is that correct or am i mis misinterpreting I believe there was no spatial restriction on where that additional male quota could come from. Um, but this is definitely more related to the addendum eight conversation, I think. Thanks. Uh, do we have any other further questions? Uh, I see Shanna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Anstead, for your presentation. Um, I, I had a question regarding the uh, catch survey model. Um, I think you noted that it might be underestimating the population since we're not really capturing those uh, newly matured crabs and the model's kind of struggling with the fact that we're, we are capturing a high number of mature crabs. Um, is there any scenario, um, and you kind of went through the different scenarios of why that might be happening, catchability, et cetera. Um, is there any scenario where the uh, committee might believe that we're um, overestimating the population with the catch survey model or are we really just underestimating right now? In the graph where I plotted the two, you can see that sometimes the catch survey model estimates more than the Virginia Tech survey and sometimes it does less and that's because it's taking more things into consideration. So if we have a high primiparis, it will show up in a higher multi uh, newly mature and mature the next year. So it's not going to always match the Virginia Tech trial. That's not that's one reason why we think the method's better is because it's using the Virginia Tech trial specifically for scaling, but these additional sources of data are helping to better inform an estimate. So I suspect that we're underestimating it in the last couple of years because of this issue with the newly mature, but it's the best data we have. So it, maybe it's nailing it, you know, but I suspect that it's underestimating it because I, I suspect we have a catchability issue or maybe a misidentification issue, but let's not rule out the third and look at more data to find out. Thank you, Kristen. Does that answer your question, Shanna? It does, thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? I see Joe Semino and then Jim Gilmore. Thanks, Mr. Chair. No, just a comment, it, it made me think about um, what was presented and, and, and thank you, Kristen, for, for that. Um, just 
you know, we went through our climate scenario planning workshop and, and this is one of the big concerns, right? Is like, if, if things are changing, then, you know, we need to be ready for that for our surveys. And, you know, I, I hope that this group is looking through, ahead and thinking of what this might mean uh, you know are, are, is the timing changing and are we missing things and um, you know how do we move forward there it's it's going to be an important question for all of our surveys and um, the Virginia Tech trawl survey in particular has always been a priority of ASMFC and, we'll, and New Jersey DP and will continue to be so thank you thanks Joe Jim yeah, and just a uh, comment also, just following what Joe said, I have to go on through the material. I had several questions to Kristen, but uh, your presentation was outstanding, and you answered every one of them. So, so good job. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and indeed, that was a wonderful summary there, Kristen. Okay, if we don't have any further questions for Kristen, now we move back to agenda item four, which is to consider a draft addendum eight for uh, approval and for that i'll kick it over to caitlin to bring us up to speed thank you mr chair and um, so i'll be going through the addendum eight options public comments and advisory panel input on the addendum i'll start off with some background leading up to this meeting the timeline for the actions development proposed management options and then again cover public comments and ap report will be given by brett hoffmeister our ap chair and then i'll wrap up with action for board um, to consider today and next steps next um, to provide some context for today's discussion again our current management program for horseshoe crab bait harvest of delaware bait origin was established by addendum 7 to the horseshoe crab fmp in 2012. Addendum 7 implemented the use of the Adaptive Resource Management or ARM framework um, for recommending the bait harvest quotas for the Delaware Bay region states based on abundance of both horseshoe crabs and red knots. And as we've discussed, the ARM underwent a revision which was endorsed by the peer review panel. And in January of this year, the board accepted the ARM revision and peer review for management use. And at that same meeting, the board also initiated this addendum, draft addendum eight, which considers using that revised arm in setting the annual specifications for horseshoe crabs of Delaware Bay origin. And that's what we're discussing today. Um, so after the January meeting, the PDT has worked on this addendum document. The board approved it for public comment in August. And then we held state public hearings and received written comments in August and September. And that leads us to today to have the board consider final approval of the draft addendum. And so now I'll just review the proposed options. So draft addendum A includes two main management options. Option A is no action and option B would be to use the revised arm for uh, management to set the bait harvest specifications for the Delaware Bay. Option A is no action because true status quo will not be possible in future years. And this is because the software that was used to run and update the original R model is obsolete. So since that model can no longer be updated, that means we cannot continue doing adaptive resource management with it as it was established in Addendum 7. So as a result, the no action option would re result in the management program reverting back to the provisions of Addendum 6. And I'll go over those shortly. Um, alternatively, Option B would adopt the changes that were recommended in the 2021 arm revision and peer review and this means that the updated data and model would be used to produce annual harvest recommendations for the delaware bay origin horseshoe crabs and the general structure of how the arm optimal harvest recommendation is allocated among the four delaware Bay states would essentially remain the same and i'll also go into detail on that shortly so under option A, if no action is taken, management would revert back to the provisions of addendum six. And that means the quotas for the four states of New Jersey through Virginia would go back to those shown on this table. And additionally, um, beyond the quotas, these are the other provisions of addendum six that would go back into effect if no action is taken. First, the directed harvest and landing of all horseshoe crabs in New Jersey and Delaware would be prohibited from January 1st through June 7th, and harvest of female horseshoe crabs in New Jersey and Delaware would be prohibited year round. Additionally, from January 1st through June 7th, directed harvest and landing of horseshoe crabs in Maryland and landing of horseshoe crabs in Virginia from federal waters would also be prohibited. And no more than 40% of Virginia's annual quota would be allowed to be harvested east of the Coal Regs line. 
and horseshoe crabs that are harvested east of the Coleriggs line and landed in Virginia must be comprised of a minimum male to female ratio of two to one. So to highlight the important points here, under option A, New Jersey and Delaware would not be allowed any female harvest, um, but this action would not affect New Jersey's voluntary moratorium on all horseshoe crab harvest. Um, for Maryland, the quota of 170,653 crabs is not restrictive by sex, and there are no spatial restrictions on where that quota can come from um, in the Addendum 6 provisions. However, all harvests would be prohibited from January 1st through June 7th. And then for Virginia, again, only 40% of that total quota can come from east of the Coleriggs line, and there's no harvest from federal waters allowed from January 1st through June 7th. Option B in the addendum would, again, adopt the changes to the arm recommended in the 2021 revision and peer review, and going forward, we would use that revised arm to annually recommend and set the specifications for bait harvest of Delaware Bay origin horseshoe crabs. Option B addresses each of these aspects that were established in addendum 7 related to how the harvest specifications are set or recommended, um, which include the harvest recommendations that come out of the arm, the adaptive management cycle, the percent of each state's harvest that is considered to be of Delaware Bay origin, the state allocations of the overall Delaware Bay quota, and then fallback options for setting specifications. So I'm going to walk through each of these one by one and review what's in the addendum. For the annual harvest recommendations, Addendum 8 proposes that the revised ARM framework would be used to annually recommend optimal harvest levels for males and females. The maximum number of males and females that can be recommended by the ARM would not change, and they remain at 500,000 males and 210,000 females. However, where the original ARM recommended one of those five harvest packages, the revised ARM recommends sex-specific harvest levels on a continuous scale. And there are two sub-options here which would result in the optimal harvest output for each sex being rounded down to either the nearest 25,000 or 50,000 horseshoe crabs. And again, rounding that harvest recommendation to some degree is necessary to protect confidential data that are input into the model. Um, so rounding the output from the arm would prevent anyone from being able to back calculate those confidential data. Sub-option B1 would round down to the nearest 25,000 crabs and would generally result in a harvest recommendation that's closer to what the optimal harvest is that comes out of the arm um, before rounding for confidentiality. And then option B2 would round down to the nearest 50,000, so that would re result in a more conservative harvest recommendation. Um, one clarification is that if the arm were to recommend the maximum amount of either males or females, rounding would not be necessary to protect those confidential data because it's already being limited by that maximum. So this is an example of the harvest recommendations produced by the revised arm for 2019 through 2021. So these are relevant to the future years, but I just want to show you what they look like. Uh, the table shows the female and male horseshoe crab population estimates, the red knot stopover population estimate, and then the resulting harvest recommendation for each of those years if we use the revised arm. And as a note, these are using coastwide biomedical mortality data rather than Delaware-based specific confidential um, data. So these are not confidential um, numbers, but they are likely a slight overestimate of what we would get if we use confidential biomedical um, from Delaware-based specific. So in each of these years, the revised arm would have recommended the maximum or just short of the maximum amount of male harvest and a varying amount of female harvest ranging from around 150,000 to 127,000 crabs. And on this next slide is an example of how rounding those options, um, the rounding options in the addendum would be applied to the recommended harvest that comes out of the arm using the 2020 number as an example. So in the uppermost table is the 2020 ARM recommendation um, for optimal male and female harvest. And then the next table shows the harvest that sub-option B1 would result in, so 20, 125,000 females and 500,000 males. And in the last table, the female harvest would be rounded down to 100,000 crabs rather than 125. And I'll just throw these up shortly. These are, for comparison, the harvest packages that were used in Addendum 7. So the second item under Option B in Addendum 8 is the management process for the ARM framework. So Option B would establish this three-level process, which includes an annual management process, an interim update process, and a revision process. The annual management process is 
essentially exactly the same as what we're currently doing under Addendum 7, and that's that annually the ARM framework would be used to produce a harvest recommendation for the upcoming fishing year. The interim update process would be that every three years the model parameters, including things like the red knot survival and recruitment rates and horseshoe crab population parameters would be updated based on the most recent years of data from the Delaware Bay region. And then the third level would be a more intensive revision process occurring every nine to 10 years in which the ARM framework would undergo a revision similar to what we did in 2021. Uh, this timeline was chosen because it allows for two interim updates to occur, and it also encompasses an entire generation for horseshoe crabs. The third issue under option B is the proportion of harvest in each state that is of Delaware Bay origin, and this value is called lambda. Um, so option B would update these lambda values for each of the states based on the most recent genetic data, which was recommended in the ARM revision and peer review. And this would result in decreases to the proportions of Maryland and Virginia's harvest that's assumed to be of Delaware Bay origin, whereas Delaware and New Jersey's remain unchanged. So I'll go over the details here, but these lambda values do affect the state-by-state -state allocations of the overall Delaware Bay quota. So for comparison here, are the current lambda values used in the original arm and addendum 7 on the left compared to the proposed updated lambda values on the right. The fourth issue under option B is the methodology for calculating the state allocations of the total Delaware Bay harvest. Um, so in option B, the allocation methodology from addendum 7 is basically the same with the exception of those updated lambda values. So changing those lambda values does result in new allocation weights for each state. Um, specifically, the new state allocations of the Delaware Bay harvest limit would be those shown in the table on the top right. Um, compared to the allocations in Addendum 7, the new allocations for New Jersey and Delaware slightly increase and the allocations for Maryland and Virginia slightly decrease. And I'll show a comparison of those in a second. Um, I do want to note here that with all of these numbers, we're only talking about Virginia's quota for crabs harvested east of the Colregs line, and that's what's considered to include Delaware Bay origin crabs. So the other two aspects of state allocations that were in Addendum 7 and carried forward in Addendum 8 under Option B are the harvest cap provision and the two to one male female offset provision. And these are remaining status quo from addendum seven. Um, the harvest cap for Maryland and Virginia limits the total level of allowed harvest by those two states in order to provide protection to crabs that are not of Delaware Bay origin. So the caps are shown in the bottom table and those were based on the addendum six quota levels for Maryland and Virginia. So these caps do not apply when the ARM framework recommends zero female harvest of horseshoe crabs. So as a result, these caps have never been applied to Virginia and Maryland to date. The two to one offset is only relevant when the arm recommends zero female horseshoe crab harvest. Um, when the recommended harvest is zero, then this provision allowed a two to one offset of males to females for Maryland and Virginia, which allowed Maryland and Virginia male harvest allocation to increase, um, making up for those females that were not allowed. And these are the current state allocations resulting from the new lambda or the old lambda values and then on right the new lambda values and the resulting state allocations. So this uh, on this slide, I'm going to walk through an example of how the total Delaware Bay quota is allocated if the harvest quota recommendation after it's rounded down. Um, gets split up amongst the states. So in this example, I'm showing a breakdown among the four states um, if we're using 500,000 males and 100,000 females. And once again, this is just the Delaware Bay portion of these states' quotas. And then on this slide, you can see both the Delaware Bay origin quotas on the left in the blue and the total quotas that include the non-Delaware Bay origin crabs on the right in the orange for each state using the revised allocations. So Delaware and New Jersey are the same on both sides, blue and orange, because 100% of their harvest is considered to be of Delaware Bay origin, whereas Maryland and Virginia's overall quotas, which are shown in the red font, are greater than their Delaware Bay only quotas, and that's accounting for those additional crabs in their harvest that are not of Delaware Bay origin. So in this example, the harvest caps for Maryland and Virginia are being applied because there is female harvest recommended from the arm, so because of that, the total quota for Maryland is 170,653 crabs, and the total for, Vir for Virginia east of the Colregs line is 60,998. 
Um, these are equal to the quotas, again, that were in Addendum 6 for Virginia and Maryland. The last item under Option B is the fallback options for how harvest specifications would be set if the arm cannot provide a harvest recommendation in a given year. And this is basically the same as what's in Addendum 7, which is that if in a given year the model in the arm, there's not enough data or some other issue um, that causes it to not be able to produce a harvest recommendation, the next year's harvest could be set either based on the Addendum 6 quotas and management measures for the four Delaware-based states, um, or based on the previous year's ARM framework harvest level and allocation to the four states. And beyond that language, the Addendum 8 does update this section to reflect new data sets that are required for running the revised ARM model. Um, so now I'm going to transition into the summary of public comments that we received on Draft Addendum 8. The public comment period started in mid-August and ended on September 30th, 2020, 2022. <laughs> um, and during that period, we had four public hearings that we held, one in person and three on webinars. And across those four hearings, there were 69 public attendees. And in total, during the comment period, we received 34,613 written public comments. Of those 34,000 comments, these included 24 letters from organizations, 245 comments from individual industry stakeholders and members of the public, as well as eight form letters that were submitted by a total of 33,932 individuals. Um, so for our purposes, three or more comments that have the same language or state support for uh, single organization's comments are considered a form letter. Um, however, if a comment includes additional comments or rationale related to a potential management action beyond what's in the original letter, then it's considered to be an individual comment. So that's just how we count those. Um, during the four public hearings, we had 18 comments that were provided in person. And so I want to spend a moment here explaining how these comments were categorized because there is some nuance to this. Uh, many of the comments we got did not say explicitly which management option they supported. So in some cases, there was a need to interpret some comments. Um, for example, comments that made statements to the effect of, I strongly oppose the use of the 2021 arm for setting horseshoe crab harvest regulations, or ASMFC should reject or abandon Addendum 8, or I oppose the proposal to increase the harvest of horseshoe crabs, or oppose Addendum 8. These comments were interpreted as in being in support of option A because the opposition to the revised ARM framework was made clear. Um, support of option B was usually stated fairly clearly in the comments, but in some cases, interpretation had to be made. So for example, in comments that stated their support for the revised ARM framework, but also stated they did not want to see any female harvest allowed, we put under we put that under support for option B, given the caveat that the board could still restrict female harvest through specifications if the arm is adopted. Lastly, we had to mark some comments as not stating support for a particular option at all. And this was done when a comment advocated for something that was outside the scope of possibilities in the draft addendum options. So for example, if a comment said something to the effect of wanting the board to retain the current arm framework, or comments that advocated for a complete horseshoe crab moratorium, for example, that was categorized as no option selected. So this is the breakdown of how comment of the comments and which options were preferred. So as you can see in the table here, support for option A was expressed in the majority of the comments, both written and delivered at hearings. Um, three comments one written and two at hearings were in support of option B to adopt the ARM revision for setting specifications. And of those two comments included a preferred sub option, one favored each of those sub options, B1 and B2. And then there were a chunk of comments that could not be classified as being clearly in support of either option. So within the comments that supported option A, the most common reason that um, they supported it was that they opposed any female horseshoe crab harvest being allowed for the Delaware Bay. A few of the comments that supported option A did acknowledge the fact that option A would allow for female harvest um, from Maryland and Virginia, but the large majority of them did not. The other comments um, did not agree with the fact that the arm revision does not have the same population thresholds for horseshoe crab and red knot that were in the original arm framework, which had to be exceeded to allow female harvest. 
Um, many comments express their concern about the red knot population and recovery as their reason for supporting option A, and some also express concern about the horseshoe crab population and concern that allowing female horseshoe crab harvest could have cascading impacts on the ecosystem. There were also a number of comments that criticized the revised arm for various reasons, including statements that the modeled relationship in the arm between horseshoe crabs and red knots was weak, um, that the horseshoe crab population model does not properly account for uncertainty. Um, some comments took issues with the data that were used in the arm revision, stating that the arm did not use the egg density data in the models, and some disagreeing with the equal weighting of the three horseshoe crab surveys that go into the population model. Um, other comments stated that they did not feel there was sufficient stakeholder input in the revision process, and many comments were critical of the fact that the models were not available for the public to review during the comment period. Comments from organizations in support of option B generally expressed a desire to, um, from individuals and organizations, generally expressed a desire to use science-based management, and some supported the new ARM framework's ability to make updates and improvements to the modeling approach and the data. Um, one of the organization comment letters did state support for the ARM is the best management approach, but they did caveat their support with a request to not allow female harvest for a period of 10 years in order to allow another generation of horseshoe crops to mature and to allow the population to stabilize at the projected equilibrium um, in the ARM model. There was also support for prioritizing the research that was recommended in the ARM framework revision and peer review, including additional data collection to support the inclusion of egg density information in the model and research to better understand the effects of climate change on spawning and breeding habitat for horseshoe crabs and red knots. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the comments submitted did not support either of the proposed management options. Instead, um, some asked for a complete moratorium on female harvest or in some comments, a full moratorium on all horseshoe crab harvest. Um, there were some comments that expressed concerns with the sublethal impacts and mortality associated with biomedical collections. Some others said that the eel and whelk fisheries, which use horseshoe crab as bait, are not in good condition and those fisheries should be limited. And a number of comments expressed a desire for a more holistic ecosystem-based management approach for the Delaware Bay resources. And now I'm going to hand the mic over to Brett Hoffmeister, our AP chair for the AP report. Thank you, Caitlin. So the uh, AP met virtually on October 13th. Uh, seven advisors attended the meeting. Uh, the ASMFC staff provided a summary of Addendum 8 and, of course, the option to revert to uh, Addendum 6. A summary of metrics concerning the public comments was also reviewed. And we had general discussion, uh, basically, you know, agreeing that management should adapt to use the best available science. Uh, the horseshoe crab populations have improved under our management. Uh, the data that was presented is, is seeing that, you've seen that with the Virginia Tech. Um, that said, the AP also wants to acknowledge the public comment in opposition, in opposition of Addendum 8. I think the general comments and the general feeling from the AP was that the ARM process is, is obviously much more complex than it's often described, and that the oversimplification of some of these form letters may not be an accurate description of the model or the good work that's been done. But clearly, the spirit of public comment reflects a desire to pr protect female ocean crabs for the benefit of the crabs ecosystem and the red knot. I wanted to point out that the arm, the original arm and the revised arm, have that purpose in mind. This is consistent with that desire. Next slide, please. Reverting back to addendum six would, would decrease bait quotas in some areas and allow uh, female harvest in others. Also, we're burning back to Addendum 6, set quotas based on historical landings, uh, independent, of it, in, independent of other data and exclusive of the most recent data. Reducing the bait harvest in the Delaware Bay area could mean additional pressure in the Northeast. So there were some comments uh, regarding the balloon effect, something that we have seen in Massachusetts on a, on a small scale and, and uh, even on a larger scale as females from Massachusetts find their way south. So there was a genuine concern there. Uh, just a reminder, you know, to the AP that the, the states do have the ability to implement stricter controls if they desire to do so. The AP was amenable to a, a modest harvest of females supported by the data, but also not averse to the board conservatively limiting female harvest. So we are sensitive to the public comment, but I think we really want to see science drive the decision making here. Uh, the AP recognizes the importance of, of horseshoe crabs in the ecosystems, the economy, and the fishing community. So there's multiple stakeholders here. <laughs> 
Um, that said, the AP members present unanimously supported Addendum A, Option B, with no sub-option as, as a um, preference, this being the best science-based management option available. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion after the, the meeting. It broke maybe days later, and a, a couple of points that needed to be made by the AP or wanted to be made by the AP, that, that coastal development is really a major factor affecting beach habitat for both red knots and the horseshoe crabs. Um, there was there was comment that perhaps the Virginia Tech survey should run toes earlier in the year to capture some of these large number of juveniles that, that some of the fishermen are seeing that may not be reflected in, in the uh, um, assessments. But I wanted to point out that there's a lot of additional key aspects of red knot decline and as a disturbance of birds and habitat from relentless coastal development. Um, these things must be kept in mind when discussing horseshoe crab harvest impacts and supporting the management recommendations. So there's there's a lot of things at play here. And that's all. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, uh, Caitlin, for those excellent uh, summaries of public comment and the explanation of the addendum. But Caitlin, you have a couple couple more slides, right? Just one, Mr. Chair. Um, so this slide is just to set the board up for their discussion today. So first, the board will need to select a management program from the proposed options and finally consider approval of drafted item A to the Horseshoe Crab FMP. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you, Caitlin. And as Caitlin, uh, so did such an excellent summary of the public comment. There has been a heck of a lot of public comment and there's a lot of questions raised. So before we get into discussion of the addendum, let's take some questions. Bill Hyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a, a follow up a little bit to the question that Rick asked earlier. I'm still struggling with understanding fully the two to one trade off that, that's in the addendum. So I'm going to ask kind of a hypothetical and maybe maybe that'll help me understand. So um, as I understand it, if if the arm model calls for female harvest, um, there's a, a, a two to one trade off that comes into play. So my question is, if the arm calls for female harvest, but the board then decides on a male only a quota, is there any um, does that two to one come into play at all? I hope I've asked that clearly. <laughs> Okay, Bill, uh, Tony will address that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was hoping this would not come up, but <laughs> um, so Caitlin and I did a little homework and went back and looked at the uh, minutes from all of the board meetings leading up to the approval of the arm when the two to one offset was originally discussed. Because as you saw in Caitlin's presentation earlier, it does say that two to one offset is for when the arm sets the female harvest at zero. So that's pretty specific language. Um, and when you go back and read the minutes, it was very clear that that offset was to provide for, to make up for the lack of those larger females and to give additional males um, to make up for it. And it did not talk about the arm setting at zero. It was just about the just providing that offset there. So to us, the intention was there to allow for that, but the language in the document is very specific to the arm. So it would be the board's decision of whether or not you think the intention was there or if you want to stick with the language that is in the addendum. We will leave it to you all. Thank you, Tony. Bill, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just a follow-up. So the cleanest way would be to accommodate for that within the actual, if we were to set a male-only quota, could be to just incorporate that into the decision over what number to pick. So you got the answer you needed, Tony, to yeah. respond? Just needed to check one thing before I responded. Yes, you could just add additional mail quota to the harvest allowance that you're giving. Thank you. That, that definitely helps. Thanks, Bill. Joe, you had a question. Joe Semino. I, I will get to a question for Caitlin, and, and, and thank you to both Caitlin and Brett for uh, those great presentations. But I, I think this gets to this conflated issue, but what Bill was just talking about is a challenge, and I, I, I know, Mike, it certainly is for you. Um, you, you know, 
this erroneous assumption that what a model suggests is safe harvest and then actual management action, right? I mean, this is now in the New York Times erroneously as, as an ASMC proposal when it's just a model suggestion. And um, I, I, I'm very troubled by that wording that we got in there, and I hope that we can, we can remedy that because what we actually set as harvest is what impacts the resource and what should impact the, the two to one ratio. And so I, I just wanted to put that on the record. And then second, you know, this is something that um, has always bothered me with weak fish as well. We have, we have genetic work that, that distributes the catch of Florida's weak fish catch between sand sea trout and, and weak fish. And we have uh, the catch composition here in the Lambda, but we don't have um, a time frame for how often that should be updated. And, you know, luckily genetic work is getting cheaper, easier, and, and much more accurate. And so I really think we should also consider a time frame for how often we, uh, we update that work for the Lambda. So I guess it wasn't a question, but my, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, further questions? Looking around the board. Um, Shannon Madsen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for both of your presentations. Uh, my question is for Caitlin. Um, so Caitlin, I think that it was pretty clear, but I, I just kind of want you to correct me if I'm wrong. But essentially, if this board selects option A, um, we would revert back to addendum six, which would allow female harvest in Maryland with no spatial regulations. However, in Virginia, it would allow female harvest, but with those spatial regulations um, outside of the coal regs line. So essentially before us today are two decisions, either option A or option B, and both of those options allow female harvest. That's correct, Shanna. Um, so as you stated, Maryland's quota would go back to 170,653 horseshoe crabs and that could be male or female. It's not restricted by sex, um, and it's not restricted by area. Um, for Virginia, female harvest would be allowed. Um, so the way that works is the total quota for Virginia would be 152,495 horseshoe crabs, and then 60,998 can come from east of the coal rakes line, and 40% of that's 40% of the total quota. Um, the crabs that come from east of the coal rigs line have to be the, at a sex ratio of two to one. Okay, and the next question we have is from Mike Luisi. Yeah, this might be a little more than a question, but just a comment as well. Um, you know, I guess the thing that, and I asked this before, but I'm, I'm gonna bring it up again. I feel like, we're challenged by this new this new information uh, in the fact that there's going to be a pretty dramatic industry impact because the the model's telling us we can harvest females, but if we choose to not harvest females, there's going to be a pretty large reduction in in our bait harvest. And um, I'm just, I'm looking to staff, looking to you, Mr. Chairman, others, members around the table. Is there, I mean, we've been successful in what we've done given, given the quotas and that we've had. And I'm, I just find it challenging that if we decide not to harvest the females that the, that the model's telling us we are allowed to, then we have to cut, we don't get that two to one ratio and we have to, and we have to cut back on on our bait harvest, which is going to be impactful to the industry. And so it's going to be hard for me to go home and say, guys, you have the opportunity to harvest females, but if you, choose, you know, based on the pressure that we're under for to not harvest females, if you choose not to, you're going to lose 80,000 crabs. It's, it's, I mean, if, I, I just wish there was some way out of the box that we could just kind of maintain what we have. And I feel like we've been pretty successful. And uh, I just offer that as a comment and see if there are any thoughts around the table as to how we can just 
kind of keep doing what we're doing. You know, I don't know. Thanks, Mike. And I think that was an issue kind of brought up by Bill's question. So, Tony, you want to respond to that? Uh, uh, John, I was, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to say, I think, um, Mike, what Bill was, I believe Bill was alluding to is that, um, and what I was trying to point to is that the arm is giving you a recommendation for quota doesn't mean the board has to set it at exactly what the arm is recommending. So therefore, you could provide a value that gives you that offset as originally in the underlying intention of what the board was trying to do when they originally put together the offset. It was just provided for that. When the board is not harvesting any females at all, then you're giving that extra males to make up for it. And so the board could set a higher quota um, that is possible. And then there's also always the possibility of transfers as well. That is a much simpler solution. And Mike, you want to follow? Yeah, up? no, I just wanted to say, I apologize. I had to step away from the table for a minute and I might've missed Bill um, between walking from here up to my, it, it, I was, it, it takes about 10 minutes to get up to your room uh in this place so um i had to step away for a second so i apologize if i missed that but i tony thank you for that uh, summary mike and i think that was very helpful to Marilyn's situation and shanna you had a follow-up question i think i'm i think i'm good mr chair i was just trying to help um mr louisi out thank you uh rick jacobson thank you mr chair i actually wanted to follow up on shanna's earlier question i just want to be clear if we were to vote for option a we would revert to addendum six and the total allow uh, the total quota of females that could be harvested from delaware bay approaches two hundred thousand. i'm going to pull up the slide so that you can see it more clearly if it's the same slide i'm thinking of i'm not sure it's clearer to me <laughs> So under option A, these are the quotas that would go back into effect for each state. And for New Jersey and Delaware, there's 100,000 crabs allocated each. Maryland gets 170,000, but not all of those would necessarily come from the Delaware Bay as their lambda value is about half. Um, and then for Virginia, the 60,998 are East of the Corey's line, so some of those could be from Delaware Bay. So, so am I interpreting that as if the lambda is 50 for Maryland, 85,326 could come from Delaware Bay, and yes. there is no restriction on sex, they could all be females. So, 85,000 potential females, and from Virginia, 40% of 671,000, so another 28,000. So something in the neighborhood of 100,000 females could come from Delaware Bay. Yes, something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was rough math, but thank you. Thanks. Do we have any further questions? And I'm not seeing any. And um, Kristen, if I could just bring up, um, based on the uh, huge amount of comments we, we received, but some of them were very very detailed and um in particular the um two uh scientists that sent detailed uh critiques of the arm and then just more recently uh, another paper about egg density could you just let us know what the arm subcommittee is um their considerations about those type of detailed comment Sure, thank you. The inclusion or exclusion of the egg density surveys has been debated by the arm since its inception. Uh, during the old arm, the arm subcommittee chose not to use that data because the surveys that were operating were using different methods. We couldn't make it be one time series and it was a challenge. Also, the arm manages for the horseshoe crabs the, in that abundance is related to egg density. So we manage the crab so it's easier to use the abundance indices uh, as the direct measure of horseshoe crabs. With that said, 
when we do a new stock assessment, we always ask for more data. What do you have? Give us everything and we'll look at it. No egg density data was submitted for our consideration. I did have a conversation with uh, the author of the egg density paper that recently came out, uh, Smith, and we talked about the data, but we didn't have it in hand. It has since been published and we did extract that time series out of the paper to compare it to what we have from Virginia Tech Troll, from the catch survey model. And our model goes from 2003 to 2021. The trend is quite similar actually in the egg density survey. They kind of all track each other. During that time series, they all start out kind of low and they increase through the terminal year. Um, we could put the egg density survey in the catch survey model, which I have done, and you get similar results. It probably isn't sufficient to some because it doesn't go farther back in time. But unfortunately, I can't go farther back in time. I would love to go farther back in time with the model to, uh, you know, before the pressure was on horseshoe crab, but our data starts in 2003. Thanks, Kristen. And um, once again, the, the amazing amount of work and modeling done by the ORM subcommittee. And, you know, there are all these um, other factors came up. And just one other comment that I saw a, a, coming up a bunch was the, um, I believe in one of the critiques showed that if the, or the the weak linkage between horseshoe crab population and the red knot population and what's happening there because the model would, seems to show that even if there were no horseshoe crabs, red knots could still increase. So That's correct. Our model shows a very weak but significant link between horseshoe crab abundance and red knot survival. That's using the data from the region. We can't make it be a stronger link. We believe that these two populations are linked and we have modeled it that way. But if more years of data come out and that, and that relationship falls apart, we do have to rethink some of the arm, but this is the best data we have in hand. In the original arm and this arm, there was always these different possibilities of these populations are not linked, that they're linked uh, in a weak way or they're linked in a strong way. And we, we're just using the data that we have, and that's how it came out. There are probably other factors that we're not able to model at this time, and hopefully in a decade, it'll be better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And as we know, uh, the, the strong correlation possibly seen earlier in the time series could have been done due to other factors other than the fact of a direct linkage there. But thank you very much for those explanations. And if there are no further questions about the public comment, oh, uh, Joe Semino. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I just, I just have a, I just have a comment on that. I mean, you know, what we see between the relationship of these two species is I, I, kind of, and I think maybe even at one point in time, described by Fish and Wildlife Service as a phenomenon. Right? This is a, you know, previous to the 80s, we were not sure that this linkage was there. It's a molluscivore that that is highly dependent on horseshoe crab eggs now in the Delaware Bay. Um, but we all acknowledge that things are changing. And so that relationship may be changing as well. And fortunately, we're able to start tagging these birds in a way we weren't. And, you know, we have to understand their usage of the Delaware Bay. Now, the importance of horseshoe crab eggs isn't going to change. But if the usage of the Delaware Bay by these birds changes, then we might lose that relationship. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And again, it was more just because that was such a theme that came up that I'm just good to address it a bit here. And uh, I guess before we go on to deliberation of our management actions regarding addendum, draft addendum eight, are there any further questions? Not seeing any. Um, if it's the will of the board, perhaps we would start. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We have a question coming from online from uh, Chris McDonough. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, you have the microphone on now. Um, this is is more of a comment, um, just kind of in running from the model um, and the relative scale in looking at you know what the model are and the the estimated harvest levels. Um, and what the population levels that the that the model is outputting, you know, the 
the natural mortality, you know, the estimated natural mortality, 0.3, 30%, um, those harvest levels represent a fraction of what even the natural mortality is. And so, you know, at the, the level, the, I understand the linkages, what may or may not be there between the red knot population and, and the horseshoe crab abundance, but the, the processes that are going on and that I just, I always have problems with the connection between the red knot and the horseshoe crab um, population in these models because those connections are very tenuous and, and, and small things in the model can change that a lot. Um, and so that's, you know, that I guess that's my comment is that, you know, given the way the, 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 the population estimates come out, um, just the natural mortality alone just swallows up what could possibly be harvested um, through bait, through biomedical, whatever, all that stuff. Um, so anyway. Thanks, Chris. Kristen, do you want to add anything to that or? No, just that he's correct, that we're talking about very different scales here, and that's why the model has responded the way it has. If you have, you know, you would have been in this situation either way. The old arm also recommends female harvest, that when you're talking about a population, whether it's 6 million or 15 million mature females, that the removing 100,000 isn't going to register the same way that natural mortality does. He's correct. Thanks. Um, okay, well, let me just check again. Is there any... Anybody else online that has a question? Uh, we don't have any further questions. In that case, uh, as I was saying, now we move into uh, board discussion and consideration of approval of draft addendum eight. And uh, perhaps, oh, uh, well, were you ready to further discussion, Chan, or do you want to make a motion? Okay, let's move right to a motion and then we can get the discussion going. So go ahead, Shanna. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think it always helps for us to have a motion on the table for us to, um, you know, incite a bit of discussion. So if I get a second, I'll uh, go ahead and um, give you why I am making this motion. So my motion is move to implement option B, which is implementing the ARM revision for setting bait harvest specifications for Delaware Bay origin horseshoe crabs. And with that sub-option B1, which is rounding down the continuous optimal harvest specifications to the nearest 25,000 crabs. Um, and additionally, I would like to add to the end of that motion with the intent to allow the two to one offset allowance for Maryland and Virginia if the board sets female horseshoe crab harvest at zero. Thanks, Shannon. And we have a second from Mike Luisi, and we'll just give it a second here to get the motion up there. And that was a uh, very comprehensive motion. I think it covers, I think you pretty much covered all the issues, didn't you there, Shannon? Is that your motion? That is my motion. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. And uh, let me throw it back to you, Shannon, to uh, um, talk about the motion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so, you know, the intent of the original arm was really born from a desire to protect female horseshoe crabs for the benefit of the species, as well as the benefit of the ecosystem and red knots. Um, and the point was really to be responsive to changes in that ecosystem through evidence-based science. Um, you know, over the past decade, I think we've heard from our experts that we've collected more complete data sets um, on shorebirds and horseshoe crabs, and we've advanced our modeling techniques. Um, this updated mar arm really does fulfill the original intent and goal of the arm overall. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Anstead asked earlier, who asked for this? Well, we asked for this. We asked for this update. We asked for the science. Um, and we asked for our technical experts who include both shorebird and horseshoe crab experts to give us the best available science. Um, I know that later motions are going to address the input that we've received from the public, um, and that can be done when we set our specifications. Um, but what I want to say today is if we reject the arm itself, we are essentially uh, rejecting one of our very first original ecosystem modeling approaches um, and really the recommendations from our experts and the best available science. 
Thank you, Shanna. And Mike, as the seconder, would you like to add anything? Shanna got a lot better sleep than I did last night. Um, so no, I'm not, I'll say ditto to what, what Shanna said, but I think uh, this, this motion allows for the minimal impact to the industry um, based on decisions regarding female harvest. And I, I, I appreciate the, the interest uh, for that. So um, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Shanna, uh, Tony has a follow-up just to perfect the motion. Yeah, Tony asked for a quick perfection. Um, essentially, just to say, to allow the two to one offset allowance for Maryland, Virginia, um, if the board sets female horseshoe crab harvest at zero during specification setting. Thanks, Shanna. And is there any, since the motion was already made in second, is there any objection from the board to adding that wording? And I see none. Okay, great. Okay, is there any further discussion of the motion? I see Joe Semino and then Bill Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I had the honor of sitting in your seat as we got through this process. And like Shanna touted that this was, you know, the ARM framework was early adoption of multi-species management. But we, what we learned through the peer review was that we weren't actually doing that, right? This is our first attempt at adaptive management. And so I'm fully supportive of this motion. Um, we will hopefully have further discussions about uh, what that means to all the stakeholders. But, but for right now, on this particular motion, I'm in full support. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I, I will also speak in support of the motion. Um, uh, you know, for all the reasons that that that, Sh that Shanna and Mike mentioned, um, with a little caveat, and that's that I'm I'm not convinced that the addition of the two to one offset makes things simpler or easier or or fair for anybody in this uh, in, in this process. Um, but I believe that that we'll be able to play it out in the in the specifications part of the discussion, um, and and. It could just be a function of me still not understanding that that completely. So I'm hoping to have opportunity to talk to my colleagues across the table at some point as the meeting uh, progresses. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Next, we have Rick Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I I uh, look to the chair for point of order as I wade into this. Um, in order to just extend the conversation beyond sub-option B1, I would like to offer a motion to amend for purposes of discussion that this, the motion as previously stated and adopted replacing sub-option B1 with sub-option B2. Okay, we have a motion to amend from Rick Jacobson. And do we have a second for the motion to amend? And we have Justin Davis is seconding the amendment. And so, Rick, would you like to further discuss? Yes, thank you. Uh, we at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are committed to the recovery of Rufa Red Knot and the sustainable management of horseshoe crabs. We're similarly committed to managing the recovery of red knots and sustainable use of horseshoe crabs using the best available science. We believe that the ARM model represents the best available science. We're also committed to public transparency, including sharing and providing access to the ARM model. We seek avenues to, ultimately, we will seek avenues to forestall the horseshoe crab harvest from Delaware Bay until such time as the public has ample opportunity to explore the ARM model, the model code. And as indicated in our minority report from the fall of 2021, we continue to encourage ASMFC to engage stakeholders to consider adjustments to the levels of risk tolerance that are embedded within the ARM framework. Ultimately, we're committed to the recovery of Rufa Red Knot and taking a precautionary approach, and we feel sub-option B2 would better achieve those ends. Thanks, Rick. And as the seconder, Justin, would you like to add anything? Okay, nothing there. And um, just to, uh, uh, before we get further in discussion of the amendment, uh, 
can you both, Caitlin and Kristen, uh, the round down options, both of them achieve the, um, the confidentiality requirements we have for the data, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we have a amendment to the motion on the floor. Is there any discussion of the amended motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Do we have any online? Okay, no hands online. Oh, we have Shannon Madsen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't be supporting uh, this motion to amend um, simply because the um, the option is really just a round down option in order to protect confidentiality. Um, I believe that the intent of what we're doing here is to get to specification setting where the Bay States will um, likely be discussing um, not having female harvest. So the conservation measures will come in during specification setting. Um, and, and that's why I left the motion as is um, with the 25,000 round down. Thanks, Shanna. Uh, any further discussion? Not seeing any, then I think we'll call the question. Oh, Joe. Okay, no, I was planning to have a caucus. I'm, I'm the only one here from Delaware, so I'll see what I can connect with here. Okay, so why don't we take a, with three minutes, given the situation, can we put a three minute timer up there? Great. Does anybody else need a caucus break? <laughs> How about after? Okay, uh, let's call the question now. We are voting on the amended motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so we have Fish and Wildlife Service, right? That was the. Oh, I'm, um, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to say something else. I'll say it. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. And NOAA Fisheries. And NOAA Fisheries. Okay. And all opposed, please raise your hand. Rhode, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Maryland. Delaware. Delaware. May I clarify on the record? Chris, are you voting McDonough? I don't see your hand up right now. So I'm just trying to. I Yes, I am. I have it clicked up, but. It's indicated, it's indicated yes, voting up. If you click it again, I think your hand will actually be up then. Now your hand is up, just now it's down. Okay. Letting no you know. Problem. Oh, all right. Gotcha. Thank you. So South Carolina is also against. Yes. So what is our final tally? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do we have any abstentions? Uh, New Jersey is abstaining. And do we have any null votes? No nulls. Okay, motion fails. Two in favor, 11 opposed, one abstention, and zero null. So that means the. Me. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Florida abstained from that vote as well on the webinar. Thank you. Okay, so it's two abstentions on the uh, the vote to amend. No. Okay, so we are now back to the main motion. Um, and do we need any time to caucus on the main motion? And I'm not seeing any need for that. So why don't we go right to the vote. All in favor, please raise your hands. I have NOAA Fisheries, Delaware, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Fish and Wildlife Service, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Maryland, South Carolina,
Okay, do we have any abstentions? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, man, it's been a long day already. Uh, do we have any votes in opposition? Seeing none. Um, do we have any abstentions? Florida. Okay. And do we have any null votes? Okay, seeing none of those. So the motion passes and um, 14 in favor, zero opposed, one abstention, and zero null. All right. So that is now our uh, accepted motion. And okay. So now we'll need a motion to approve the addendum as modified this morning. And I have Justin Davis as the maker of the motion to approve the addendum and Shanna Madsen as the seconder of the motion. And so for past part of the Okay, uh, Justin, would you please read the motion? Um, and, and also, do we have a seconder? Oh, sure. that's right. I'm sorry about that. Okay, go right ahead, Justin. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve Addendum 8 as modified today with an implementation date effective today. <laughs> Okay, we have the motion to approve the addendum. It's been seconded. And why don't we do this the easy way this time? Is there any opposition to this motion? Okay, not hearing any or seeing any. Um, we don't have any opposition online. Nobody needs to abstain. I see no hands. Uh, I have uh, one hand raised. Tom oh, Fody. Okay. Tom, Tom, is that in opposition? Hold on, let me make sure he's unmuted. Yep. Tom, you can speak. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Tony? Yes, we can hear you. My question is, are you voting in opposition to the no, addendum? I'm not voting in opposition. I just want to make a comment before we vote, because it's been such a controversial subject. I just wanted to state, I wish I could be there today. My back wouldn't basically allow me. But I think that we always have to use the best science available. And this is a much better science than we had before. And I fully support this motion. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And um, so other than that, we had no opposition to the motion. The motion is approved as written. And so we have now approved the addendum. Uh, before we move on to the specification setting process, would we like to take a short caucus break? <laughs> yeah, we'll take, uh, why don't we make it five minutes? Okay, can everybody be back here at 10.55? Okay, I think the board is all here now, so why don't we move on and I'll turn it over to Caitlin to discuss the specifications for 2023. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think we need to pull up a table. From the last, sorry, from the last PowerPoint. <laughs> it's slide number 39 in the last PowerPoint. We're getting there. Okay, now we're there. 
Um, so the board today will be determining what the specifications will be for the 2023 fishing year based on the ARM, which was adopted through Addendum 8 just now. Um, so the decision before the board is simply to set the specifications for the Delaware Bay states of New Jersey through Virginia. Um, as we've discussed, the board can use the ARM recommendation or make some modifications to those state quotas. Thanks. Are there any questions or do we want to go right to a motion here? Seeing no questions, I believe Shanna at, has a motion. Uh, hold on one second, Shanna. Emerson, did you have a question? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not quite following those two tables unless one is is um, um, mislabeled. Yeah. Because they both say round down to the nearest twenty five thousand. So that, problem solved. Thank this you. is the only relevant table <laughs> for your consideration. This is what is recommended from the arm for the twenty twenty three fishing year. Okay. So now, uh, hopefully, everything is clear. Now, this is the specifications for 2023, and I'm going to turn it to Shannon Madsen, who has a motion for us. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I know that I've got a motion prepared, so I'm just going to wait and read it off. <laughs> so, my motion is move to accept the 2023 ARM harvest specifications with 475,000 males and no female harvest on Delaware Bay origin crabs. In addition, the two to one offset will be added to Maryland and Virginia's allocations due to the board selecting no female harvest. Do we have a second? Mike Luisi. Discussion of the motion, uh, Adam Nowalski. A question on the application of the offset and language that's in the addendum that we approved. So some quick math I think I did on my end was Maryland and Virginia is about 30% of the quota. So we're talking about 30% of 125,000 female crabs, about 37,500. We're doing a two to one offset, so we're looking at adding about 75,000 male crabs back for a total harvest of around 550. That's my back of the envelope math. But in the addendum, there was language that said the maximum possible harvest for both females and males are maintained at 210,000 and 500,000 respectively. So with the language that was in the addendum, can we get to the 550,000 male crabs, if my math was correct, or are we constrained that we're actually still capping it at 500,000? You and your quick math, Adam. Let me turn it over to Tony. The short answer is yes, Adam. This It's the same as we had been doing under the, the old arm where for several years, we had zero females and 500 male only crabs, but then you put the two to one offset in there and it puts you above that 500 male only crabs. So we're um, working in the same method that we had before. And Caitlin will add one more piece. Thank you um, for your consideration on the screen. There's a table here that shows what the Delaware Bay origin quota is as recommended by the arm, um, if you are only looking at 475,000 males. And then on the other half of the table shows what the quotas for Maryland and Virginia would be with the offset applied. Okay, are there further comments, questions on this, Bill Hyatt? All I wanna do is speak in support of the motion. Should I do that now or are we still doing the handling questions? I Go right ahead, Bill. You, you can speak in support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I want to speak in support of this motion, uh, particularly the, the, the elimination of the female harvest. I think that the, uh, um, uh, the addendum and the ARM framework that we approved before does a great job of, of, of representing the best available science. It provides us with valuable guidance to this group on what we can do, uh, but it's our job to decide what we should do. And, and 
I think in light of a number of considerations, this motion represents exactly that, what, we sh what this body should do. Uh, it takes into consideration the, the low to non-existent numbers of newly mature female horseshoe crabs and the uncertainty uh, that, that Kristen so well described around that. It takes into consideration sort of a lack of any really convincing argument for a need to significantly improve the, the harvest of the crabs uh, and in particular, any argument to, of a need to uh, approve the harvest of female crabs. And it's really responsive to the uh, to the amount of input that we've gotten uh, from the public. So for all those reasons, I think this uh, represents a, a, a good example of what this, this group can do and is exactly what we should be doing at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Are there other comments, Shanna? Just really quickly, and I actually think Bill did an excellent job. Uh, you know, I didn't um, get to give my justification for making this motion, but what Bill summarized is my exact intent here. Um, you know, the Bay States got together and had a discussion about whether or not we felt comfortable harvesting female horseshoe crabs in lieu of all of the comments that we received. Um, and, you know, we came to this decision together, and I think this board uh, did an excellent job of really deliberating over that um, and recognizing that these two parts of the process are, are separate in that way. We can accept the best available science um, for management and make the decisions regarding what we're going to do with the harvest um, after that point. So I, I really appreciate Bill's comments and uh, Joe Semino's comments previously to that effect. Um, and and um, I hope to see this motion go forward today. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. We have uh, Tom Fody has a comment. Yeah, when um, I had a lot of meeting with legislators over the last couple of months and, and other people concerned about it, I said, we have to use the best science, but again, the board will make the decision on what they feel is right. And this motion, I think, makes that decision the right way. Just as I said to all those people out there, that's what would happen. So thank you. And I really want to also say, I really appreciate all the science that went in this, all the work by the technical committee, and, and just really it always amazes me. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Mike Luisi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just say I certainly support the motion um, and, you know, in discussions with our industry over the last few months, uh, you know, years ago, they made some considerable sacrifices uh, to the way that they operated uh, by moving to mail only over a period of time. And um, but they've evolved and understand and realize that uh, the female horseshoe crab and the importance of it and the controversy that surrounds it uh, is not something to uh, you, you don't want to poke the bear I guess that might be the way to the way to the way to put it out there bluntly so um, I appreciate the motion before us I think this gets us back to kind of a status quo if you want to call it that and uh, you know I certainly support it so thank you Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have Justin and then Joe, Joe, Justin Davis and then Joe Samir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll also speak in support of the motion. Um, kind of what Shannon was alluding to, I think this decision point is really about risk tolerance. And certainly, you know, with what we do here at the Commission, the scientific process and decisions about risk are linked, but they're not one and the same. So, you know, science can provide us advice. It can tell us where we're at. It can give us probabilities of different outcomes if we take different actions, but ultimately it's up to the board to decide how risky or not we want to be with the decisions we make. And I just think what we're doing here is in keeping with, you know, other recent decisions this commission has made to be risk averse. When I think about striped bass, the decisions we made in the rebuilding plan, we chose to use a low recruitment assumption, even though we didn't need to do that, which led to more conservative estimates of appropriate fishing mortality. The debate we had about Menhaden this week, we chose a tack that was really conservative. We didn't have to do that. We could have chosen one with a 50% probability of exceeding F, but we chose one that was really conservative. So I think this decision is in keeping with decisions this commission has made in recent history to be conservative, to be precautionary uh, when we're setting targets. So for that reason, I support this motion. Thank you, Justin. Joe Semino and then Rick Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To paraphrase Mike Luizzi, 
I think everybody around this table got more sleep than I did and, and did all the great comments. Um, but I also, I, I, two things. One, I hope we are seeing, you know, the fruits of our labor here and, and, and an increasing trend for female horseshoe crab abundance in the Delaware Bay, but we're, I think, a long way, if ever, um, in my opinion, considering um, female horseshoe crab harvest. But um, I, I would be remiss not to give my thanks to the group. I think you all know I had a chance to share and just appreciate all the hard work and, and, and for Dr. John Sweek as, as well. Um, and just thank you to all of you. Thanks, Joe. Rick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to speak in favor of the motion as well. <clears throat> um, I do believe that the arm uh, does represent the best available science, and we're committed to utilizing the best available science. Um, I also applaud the members of this board for supporting an amendment that looks beyond simply the recommendations of the arm and recognizes the public interest in the issue. I'll also be continuing to press the uh, board to continue to explore the human dimension elements of the model and the risk tolerance factors that are within it. And I also, I also would like to acknowledge our colleagues at the U.S. Geological Survey for their collaboration in the construction of the model and also their diligent efforts to make the model code available to the public. And taking this action will provide the additional time necessary for the public to gain the confidence in the model code um, in this period. So thank you very much. I look forward to uh, voting in favor of the motion. Thanks, Rick. Are there any further comments? Seeing none, um, it's time to call the question. And um, let me just see first if we can do this the easy way. Is there any opposition to the motion? And I should have asked, does anybody need time to caucus? And I'm not seeing, not seeing any hands on that, not seeing any hands in opposition. In that case, um, are there, oh, good point there. I keep forgetting that one. Are there any abstentions from the motion? Okay, so we do have one, we have one abstention, but otherwise the motion is passed by unanimous consent. Okay, fantastic. We've got the addendum approved and the specifications for 2023 set. And you might think that was it, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and now I'm going to turn it back over to Caitlin to cover agenda item six, which is review and populate a work group to review the best management practices for handling biomedical collections. Take it away, Caitlin. Problem. Caitlin's just bringing up a presentation. I'll just take a second. Oh, it's there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This should be brief and relatively straightforward. Um, so at the last meeting, the board decided to form this work group, and that's what I'm going to be discussing today. Um, so at that August meeting, the board agreed to form a work group to review the best management practices for handling biomedical catch and suggest options for updating and implementing the BMPs. Um, this was based on a recommendation from the plan development team that no action was needed related to the biomedical mortality threshold that's currently in the FMP, but that the board could continue to annually review estimated biomedical mortality levels and form this work group to address the BMPs. So um, the original best management practices document was produced by a work group in 2011, and it contains recommendations for best management practices from each step of the biomedical process from capture to returning those crabs to the ocean. Um, and these BMPs are recommendations, but they're not uh, implemented as requirements by ASMFC. There are some states that do require some of those best management practices as part of their permitting process. Um, the nominations that I received to serve on the, ma the management work group um, include these names here. So we have uh, Katie Rodrigue from Rhode Island, Derek Perry from Massachusetts, Sam McQuesten from New Jersey, Brett Hoffmeister from Associates of Cape Cod, Nora Blair from Charles River Labs, Benji Swan from Limuli Labs, and Dr. Daniel Sasson from South Carolina DNR. Um, this group represents something similar to the original work group with representation from both the bio 
bio biological and ecological um, technical side, as well as the understanding of the biomedical process side. Um, so with that today, the board can consider approving the nominations to the biomedical work group. Do we need a motion to do so, Caitlin? Yeah, uh, just to make it clean, uh, why don't we go ahead and get a motion to approve the work group? Anybody want to offer that? We have Emerson Hasbrook and seconded by Connor McManus. Uh, is there any discussion? Emerson? Do you need me to read that into the record? Great point. Yes, please do. Move to approve the nominations to the work group to review the best management practices for handling biomedical collections. Thank you. And is there any discussion of the motion? Seeing none, is there any opposition to the motion? Seeing, up, oh, are there any abstentions from the motion? Nothing? Okay, good. So the motion is approved, uh, passed by unanimous consent. So that, up, uh, oh, uh, Mike Luisi? Yeah, just a quick question, Mr. Chairman. So this jumped up on me faster than I thought it was going to. I didn't realize we were going to be approving this today. So I believe one of my members of my staff were interested in participating. Is what would the process be once I confirm that um, if somebody wanted to be added to the group, would that have to be? And I, I just want to confirm it before. Before I recommend a nomination. Um, so I just sent out a note, a quick note, but it just kind of jumped up on me pretty fast here. And I just want to see what the process would be if. Uh, and so I've just got a confirmation that uh, Steve Doctor from from Maryland DNR would like to be like to serve as part of this working group. So I don't know if we can add him. Is it is it too late to um, do that since we already approved it? I, it, well, yeah, why don't we just do it as a, is there any objection to adding Steve Doctor of Maryland DNR to the work group? Okay, and we're being told we don't need a motion, so there's no objection to adding Steve, and the good doctor will be added to the to the work group. Excellent, and he'll be very happy. Thank you very Great. much. Okay, excellent. Okay, so now we move on to... Item number seven, which is consider the fishery management plan review and state compliance for the 2021 fishing year. And that's Caitlin again. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, so quickly, I just want to note that uh, the document that went out in materials will be updated following the meeting because I have received some additional data from the states. So I just wanted to make that note. Um, so this is going to be short and sweet. Uh, this is the management history for horseshoe crab at the commission. Um, we can add addendum eight to this list um, as of today. Next slide. Um, and then on this figure, I am just showing the annual values of the reported horseshoe crab bait harvest, biomedical collections, and estimated biomedical mortality in millions of crabs. And as you can see, bait harvest and biomedical collections are slightly higher in 2021 compared to 2020. For bait harvest in 2021, the total number of crabs reported was seven. 141,684 crabs and this number is the most up-to-date and does include the landings from Connecticut that came in recently. So after this meeting I'll update the FMP review document to reflect this change. Um, the 2021 landings represent a 63% increase from the 2020 landings but it's still well below the Commission's coastwide quota for horseshoe crabs which is 1.59 million crabs. The states of Massachusetts, Delaware, New York, and Maryland made up for 84% of the total coastwide bait harvest, and each of those states represents 24%, 23%, 21%, and 15% respectively. And um, just as a note, the increase in landing seen in 2021 was likely due to 2020 landings being very low as a result of COVID. Um, the 2021 landings are more similar to 2019. In 2021, the number of crab, crabs collected for the sole purpose of LAL production in the biomedical industry was 600,000, sorry, 697,025 crabs. Um, and this represents a 3% increase from the 2020 value. 
Um, the estimated mortality from biomedical was 112,104 crabs. And as a reminder, this includes the observed mortalities that are reported, um, plus 15% of the total crabs that are bled. And in 2021, the biomedical mortality represents about 13% of the total directed mortality, which is bait harvest plus biomedical mortality. And that's about 836,000 crabs. And that total um, mortality is an increase from 2020, considering that bait harvest was much higher in 2021 than 2020. This next graph shows the total coastwide mortality of horseshoe crabs by year, broken out by bait and biomedical mortality. The orange area on the graph is the bait harvest, and the blue area is the estimated biomedical mortality. And this is just to give you a sense of the relative magnitude of each of those two sources of mortality. And I did want to make a note that the COVID-19 pandemic still had some impacts on sampling in 2021, not as much so as in 2020, um, but in 2021, the Long Island Sound Trawl Survey and the New Jersey Benthic Trawl Survey were not completed because of COVID restrictions. And for de minimis status, states um, can qualify for this if their combined average bait landings for the last two years are less than 1% of the coastwide bait landings for the same two year period. And in 2021, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida requested and meet the de minimis criteria. So the PRT's recommendations based on their review of the annual compliance reports um, are First, as it's always recommended for the last several years, the PRT recommends that the commission continue to prioritize finding long-term fund funding for the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey, as that is a critical data source uh, that we need for our current management program. And the PRT also recommends working towards getting annual estimates of horseshoe crab discard removals for the coast. Um, with regard to state compliance, the PRT found that with the exception of the surveys that were affected by COVID, as well as a late compliance report, um, all states and jurisdictions appear to be in compliance with the requirements of the FMP. So the PRT recommended approval of the compliance reports, de minimis requests, and the FMP review for the 2021 fishing year. And that's all I have. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, before we go to a motion on the uh, the plan review. Anybody have any questions for Caitlin? Okay, seeing none, can we get a motion? Mike Luisi? Yeah, I'll be happy to make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, is I've got something I please can Please go right ahead, Mike. Okay. Move to approve the FMP review, state compliance reports, and de minimis requests for South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida for the 2021 fishing year. Motion by Mike Luisi. We have a second from Jim Gilmore. Uh, any comments? Okay, seeing no hands. Um, uh, is there any opposition to approving this motion? Okay, and nothing online. So motion is approved. And the plan uh, review and state compliance for 2021 fishing year is therefore approved by unanimous consent. And I believe that brings us up to our last item, which is other business. I don't believe there was any up. We have Shanna, like to bring something up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'll, I'll make this other business brief. Um, and I don't know if it helps to have uh, my other business in motion form or not, but essentially, We've talked a lot today about the goals and objectives of the fishery and the ecosystem and protecting red knots um, for Delaware Bay origin crabs. Um, and I think it's time that we potentially sit down and start to have some facilitated workshops um, with stakeholders and managers and scientists to try to help better inform, um, you know, future goals and objectives and, and modeling approaches. Um, I will say that I envision this to be a lot like the ecosystem management objectives workshops that were held for Atlantic Menhaden. Um, they were a really great cooperative approach with um, our managers and stakeholders um, and, and scientists to really start to talk about what 
um, what our goals and objectives are for both the fishery and the ecosystem. Um, and I think that our discussions today have led me to believe that we should should start to do that as soon as possible. I know that might mean an amendment to the action plan or, or something like that, but I do believe that this is important enough that, that we should discuss it today. Thanks, Shanna. Uh, Bob, you have a response to that? Well, not a response, just maybe a, a little bit different course. Um, you know, some of the, the examples that uh, Shanna mentioned, uh, the Menhaden work and others were pretty expensive and very involved. So I think, it, and you know, as, as Shanna mentioned, we probably would need to do, in addition to the action plan, which is fine to do this, but it might be best if the staff does some work and kind of maps out some possible courses moving forward, sort of uh, different levels of workload and different options for you know workshops and costs associated with those options and that sort of thing we can bring that in back in february and then the board can sort of dig into how how involved do you want this to be you know i think it's a good idea to do it but it's there's a workload component and you know do we want to you know have the sort of cadillac version or the 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 cheap yugo version or whatever that old car was that the doors that fell off um so you know i think it, it it's probably worth um probably worth doing some staff exploration as the first step I like billing as the Cadillac or the Yugo version, but uh, <laughs> Shannon, does that meet your um, expectations? Yeah, I'm completely comfortable okay. with that, Bob. I think it makes sense to go back, reevaluate workload, and, and, and look at what funds might be available. Um, I just kind of wanted to point to the ecosystem workshop as kind of a, a maybe a framework, because I think it really did help us a lot in moving forward. And I saw Rick and then Joe. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to echo Shanna's uh, comments and, and her suggestion. I think that's the perfect path forward for us. And um, I'm totally happy with Bob's approach to going at and looking at various options to achieve those objectives that I'm very, very supportive. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Joe? Yeah, I agree that discussions need to happen. So I'm just kind of curious, Bob, on the timing, if um, you know, if you thought this would be available at the first 2023 meeting, but the Horseshoe Crab Board had no reason to meet, could we cover this at another board? I'll kind of turn it back on on the board. When do you want it? You know, it, it, we we can we can pull together a list of options in different scenarios, sort of different process options for the February meeting. But if that's the only thing the board needs to tackle, we can postpone it for a while if the board's comfortable with that. It's really, it's really up to this group. uh any further discussion of that i mean could could, could this be something done like if the suggestions be sent out by email also or we can we can send them out i think it might be worth uh, you know board discussion on when to select the option i think it may be you know because there, there's different levels of of work and, and cost and those sorts of things and that may be hard to resolve over email but we can we can share the options over email and then have a future conversation at the board Okay, thanks, Bob. Uh, Mike, before we get to you, we have Chris Wright on the webinar that would like to make a comment. Oh, I was just thinking we could, if we if we don't want to wait, we could always have a conference call. This doesn't seem like we could, and you know we've had webinars like that before, um, in between boards if needed. Tony would like to respond, but I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> the the one option is if the best management practices work group that was just formed, that their output would be available at the spring meeting. I think it's the current plans. We could just do all of these at that at the spring meeting if the board's comfortable waiting that long. Is that okay with the board? I'm seeing thumbs up here, and uh, Shanna's got a big thumb up there. And Mike, did you have any further comments you want to make, Mike? Okay. I think in that case, uh, we've resolved that item, have we? No. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Before we adjourn, I would just like to take this opportunity again to uh, thank the ASMFC staff. Caitlin's a phenomenal job of uh, getting us through all the hearings, the uh, massive amount of public comment, and thanks to the public for their um, uh, just passion and interest in this issue and i also wanted to just make special notice this new arm is just 
a such an advance in modeling and special thanks to Kristen and I know Joe mentioned John Suica. The two of them did phenomenal work on this, the entire ARM subcommittee, the technical committee. This has really been an achievement and ASMFC is rightly proud of this. So just want to say that. And um, with that, if there is nothing else, this board will stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Okay. We'll get the policy board started in about 15 minutes, a couple minutes early. But uh, give everybody time to regroup and check out and do whatever you need to do.